right, I'm Gary McNeil. I'm, uh, I'm maternally a D'Angelo. My mother, Isabel D'Angelo McNeil Alfredson, was a D'Angelo. And the first person that I'd like to really introduce would be Matthew McNeil, my son. Matthew's a, a junior at Westminster uh, Christian School in Elgin. And Matthew has a real interest in genealogy. He's traced our family all the ba way back on Ancestry.com. He's also a big old photo buff, cabinet cards and the, not, and the like. But Dundee Township has changed throughout the years. Indeed, all of you have seen it, the changes we've had recently. But the one thing that hasn't changed over the years, actually through the millennium, is the subterranean springs that are in Dundee Township. And we'll go to the first slide now, Matt, to back it up a little bit. The first, this is the oldest photo that I have of the D'Angelo property. And what happened was, this is at a place, you'll hear me mention it, called the, the horse trough off the old Spring Hill Road. And what they would do was they would water their horses as they went eastward. A lot of the locals would go to Dundee Township Cemetery East to see that, and then they'd go on from there to visit relatives and friends in the, into the city. So this actually, we used to always call it the path that cuts right through our property. And... Uh, at one point, though, it was a road. But this is the horse trough area. You can see the guy in the sleigh and that sort of thing. There's actually two pictures. One is in the oldest historical book done by Irma Dupre of the horse watering itself. And along about 1980, I had a customer come in. Now, this was 1980, so I was a lot younger. And he was older. He was 90 or 91. And he said to me, he said, you know, I'm from Woodstock, and I've been a farmer in Woodstock for years, he said. But, he goes, when I was a boy, the turn of the last century, we, I was here helping my grandmother work her farm in Dundee. And we would bring the teams of workhorses up at the end of the day to water at the horse trough on what's now your property. So that was in 1980, and he was in his 90s, and it was the turn of last century. Right around that time, you had an 18-year-old Italian immigrant who came from Prata la Polina in the Abruzzi province of Italy. His name was Anthony D'Angelo. And he got his first job on the skyscrapers in downtown Chicago washing windows. And he came with his four brothers. I'm not exactly sure who was here first, but my grandfather, Anthony D'Angelo, is pictured over here. And he had a great command of the English language, as well as Italian. So what he did was he got a job on the railroad, which railroad jobs, the rails were going in early 1915, 20, you know, great guns. And they needed a lot of workers. So they brought Italians over, and they, would, they knew really how to do hard work. And he was a supervisor of these Italians because he could communicate with them because of the language. And he could also communicate with the bosses because he was fluent in English as well. So consequently, he saw an opportunity there. And the rail yards were in Franklin Park. He lived at the time and was starting to raise his family in Melrose Park. And uh, the opportunity was, you know, all these Italian immigrants who are working on the railroad need places to live and they need stuff to buy. So he, he bought a bunch of... Uh, rental properties in the form of houses and it had a small shop that he would offer like regular supplies and groceries with and stuff like that. So he owned a lot of different properties in Melrose Park. Unfortunately, what happened after that? The Depression. He lost a lot of the properties in Melrose Park. So he came out, he thought about coming out to Dundee based on a guy that he knew who lived here who was from a nearby area in Italy. You can advance the slide again there, man. He married my grandmother, Lucy, Lucy D'Angelo, who lived in Dundee all her life, just like, like he did. But she came right over from Italy, Pratolo, the same town. And they started their family in Melrose Park. Now, this was his second wife. My grandmother, Lucy, was his second wife. His first wife passed away, as did one of his younger sons. But at the time, they were living in Melrose, living and selling, uh, selling uh, all these sundries to the railroad workers 
as well as uh, landlord to the railroad workers, as well as supervisor on the railroad. But like I said, the Depression came, times got tough, and the guy that lived here, the man who lived here, who was Italian, lived in the house that was just demolished across from Bandito Barney's. And his name was Mr. Fonte. Perhaps some of you know or have heard of uh, his daughter, Della Shufo. So Mr. Fonte at the time worked at D. Hill Nursery. And he says, Anthony, why don't you come out here? There's a big piece of property in Dundee. You could come to the countryside and get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. So he says, well, I'll come out and take a look at it. Next slide. So here they are, my family. This picture was taken at the grand opening. And uh, you had my grandmother who was holding my aunt, who's now passed away. Everybody in this picture has passed away, with the exception of one person. My mother was right there. This was taken in 1928. It was taken in front of the fountain. We'll see the fountain in a little bit. But when they first came to Dundee, he bought the property, and he... Uh, they couldn't live there, so they lived in a bungalow on Browning Street in West Dundee. That's where the family lived at the time that the place was being built. And the place is 15 acres, so you had to have people. And he wanted it to be like a little spa or sylvan retreat, I guess would be a better name for it. But he had to have people to do the work. So who do you think that he had to do the work? <laughs> the Italians who came and worked on the railroad. They needed jobs, so go ahead and advance the slide, man. So this is another site of the grand opening, and you know this because of the fact that as you go down 72, which is right here, that's the hill, but everything's overgrown now. And this is the fountain that he built, and you can see the flagpole and people around the flagpole on the fountain. And he had a big flag here, and uh, again, it was taken at the grand opening. There weren't as many trees on the property then, but he had these railroad workers come out, and... As you'll see, we have a pond on the property, one-acre pond, on other ponds. All these guys dug those by hand. They were used to digging around the rails and stuff like that. And the pond was 13 in feet deep in the middle. You know, those guys dug it by hand. So there was a lot of hard work. Go ahead with the next slide, man. Now, this is a view from the D'Angelo property looking west. So this is how, west, how it would look in East Dundee looking west at the time, like 1928. So this was standing right, probably close to where the bottling plant is right now. You know, in this picture, there's another picture of the sand piles, which you can see Emanuel Lutheran better. I'm not sure if it sits off here. This tree might be obscuring it right here. More of the grand opening. You can see... This little fountain right here was, is the inspiration to our, our label, you know, the fountain on our label. And you can see a little bit of the house. I've got a better picture of the house here. And the house is made in a really unique Italian style. I, you wouldn't call it Italian aid architecture, but it was similar. You had glazed Italian or uh, glazed brick with all these scrolls and uh, like uh, painted glass, almost Tiffany glass hanging lanterns and a terracotta roof. You'll see a better picture of it later. And people were walking around the ground seeing the spring and the fountain and all the terraced areas because the railroad workers at this point had completed uh, most of the work they were doing for my grandfather. You have to understand that my grandfather didn't come out here with the intention of bottling water. He came out here to get away from the Melrose Park life. Now, he was a trustee in Melrose Park and... Uh, I was told at the time he was a trustee, when you went to a village board meeting, I don't think the village board meetings are like this here, you had to carry a gun. That's what Melrose Park was like in the late 1920s. So, next slide, Matt. I think we saw that one already, didn't we? Oh, close up, okay. Yeah, you see, so she, you can see the size of the, uh, of the uh, flag on the hill and the people uh, around the fountain, that sort of thing. But if you notice, the one thing that's not there that you'll see in a future slide is the gazebo, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. You can go to the next slide, Matt. Okay, here's how the fountain looked. And when Phil Alio did his book, Dundee Township, that you see right over here, 
I gave him the pictures to put in there, and he says, man, he goes, Gary, all the people in this picture are dead now. Because this was taken in 1928. And I'm like, well, Phil, not all of them. That's my mother over there on the side. <laughs> so, but what this does show is this shows the original fountain in 1928. The fountain had run, the fountain has a use, not just for looks, although that's how he wanted it. If you notice, there's an angel, and the name is D'Angelo of the angels from the angels. So you see why he had the angel put there? And what happened is 75 years went by, and water was constantly running through the spring or through the fountain. Why, you ask? Every time we were, uh, the building is situated lower than the hill, the hill is where the spring is. The spring runs under high pressure from the limestone bedrock of the earth, probably from the Lake Superior water region. I've had two hydrologists out over the years come out and tell me that that's where they think it's from. And you see it's pushing and seeping through the limestone bedrock of the earth. Well, he has a pipe tapped in the orifice of the spring in 1928 and a reservoir built completely underground. And that sits, believe it, even though it's underground, at a higher elevation than our bottling plant does. So everything's gravitational feed. So once the tanks are filled, and now I've got 8,500 gallons of tank in the building, once they're filled, the water has to have some place to go. So where did it go? It came out of the lion's mouths. And then it went down through a little basin and through a network of clay tiles underneath Johnson Street, underneath uh, Van Buren Street, and emptied into the river right behind uh, Hager Pottery, the spring water that was unused. So as you can see, if you want to back up just one more, can you, Matt? The f it fell into disrepair. And in the year 2000, I had someone come out and give me an estimate on it. Because it was all, this was all black and chipped. This was off. He said, it'll be $50,000 to fix the fountain. I said, I'm sorry, I can't afford it. <laughs> so we did it on our own. What I did was we hired a carpenter to come in and duplicate the wooden scrolls. Now, this was real terracotta tile, but I figured, you know, I'm going to have to settle for something a little bit cheaper. So I went with that fake fa terracotta tile. And uh, then instead of... This, there was a lot of erosion here, so we just used some blocks to build it up, and we put basins under the lion's mouth. And I don't think it looks that bad. That was taken by Phil in 2001 when he did the book, and it looks the same to this day. This goes back to 1928. You can see the house in the picture with the hanging lanterns that I mentioned earlier. This is a spring-fed little slough, natural spring water, right next to the building it always ran. You can see the fountain and the hill and some of the tree formations. Again, more people looking throughout the property, at the buildings on the property. This little house here, you'll see the star pool in a minute. That was, they used it kind of like a bathhouse if they waited or if they sat in the star pool. And Matthew's got a picture on there of the star pool. And what you're looking at here on the, on the other side of the street, this is the current site of like where, of the berm over on the other side of Route 72 and 68. So you'd have, back here you would have uh, where Tovar Landscaping is now, the old Rakos Furniture Building, IGA, if you remember that far back. And over here you would have, you know, a development of townhomes. So in 72 ran right here, you can just barely see it. So that's how it looked, that's how it looked in 1928. And again, you can see the fountain that we use as the inspiration for our label. Now, here's a picture of the house. Now, I've got down here, new D'Angelo office made with local terracotta tile roof and glossy glazed brickwork built in 1927. At the time this was built, it was originally meant to be an office and house some of those guys who were building the property. The actual glossy brick, which is real unique, and I know Karen has seen it. Some of you have been out, out and seen it over the years. Uh, it, that was made right at the site of TC Industries, which is at 176 and 31 in, uh, in Crystal Lake now. At the time, they weren't doing steel. They were doing this glazed brick because on the back of those bricks, it says Terracotta, Crystal Lake, Illinois, Terracotta, Illinois, Crystal Lake, 1927. So what happened is he, the bungalow on Browning Street he sold. He put a dormer on here and an upstairs and he moved the family, the kids that you saw in the picture, to this, to the house. And that became the house on the property. The, or as I would call it, the original homestead. 
When I was in college, my grandmother was still alive, and she lived there, and she'd stay, spend the night at my folks' house on the other side of the property, Carl and Isabel. And uh, I would come home from college and stay the night with her uh, there so she could be in her house most of the day. So that was the home of Lucy D'Angelo up until she died in the 1980s. This is a picture that hung for years and years and years in one of the auto dealerships at, on Grove Avenue in uh, Elgin. And when there was a car salesman there who had to go to a retirement home, and he had to, and when there, his people were his heirs, his kids or whoever was cleaning out his house, they found this picture of this truck probably purchased at that auto dealership of my grandfather and Mr. Glover, who owned the truck at the time, uh, loading uh, water onto the back of the truck. And this guy had exclusively at the time an Elgin route. He would deliver to all the offices in Elgin in the 1930s and that sort of thing. If you see a lot of the early advertising, it'll say D'Angelo Natural Spring Water, distributed by Glover. He was the guy that owned the truck is what it was. But you can see the house pretty much, much looks the same to this very day. And this is where the building would come in now. But that was really a find, and I use it in most all of my brochures. He said, I think the D'Angelo's would like to have their, this picture back. You can take a look at the wooden crates with the old glass bottles, and we've got a close-up of those uh, later on. Okay, Matt. This is a real important guy. His name is Luigi Coco. Luigi, Louis was our groundskeeper on the property. Okay, he was one of those railroad guys who came over and helped build the property, dug the pond by hand, built the grape arbors, terraced them, did all the hard work. Louis remained on the property, almost lived like a hermit in a cabin until his death in 1978. And his job essentially, all the, when I was in grade school, high school, whatever, was to take care of the property, trimming the bushes. As you came down 72 in the 1940s, you wouldn't see a bunch of old dead trees like you do now. You would see the hill, and it had D'Angelo Natural Spring Water and Tropiary that he had trimmed as you came down the hill. And his name's Louis Coco. I always called him Louis, but it was Luigi Coco, and he was a railroad worker, never married. And if you go to Dundee Township Cemetery East, right near the D'Angelo main stone is Louis Stone. He's buried right by our family. This is one of my favorites, the rustic bridge. This, again, is probably something Louis made by hand out of sticks on the property. But you saw an earlier picture of the spring-fed little creek that goes by here. And this just gave people access to walk different parts of the property, but I always thought it was real picturesque. And one time they used it on one of the calendars about Dundee Township, I do believe. Now this you'd know if you saw it. This is the pond, the acre pond that I was talking about. There's just one thing that's different. See these trees? All the little pine trees that were purchased from D Hill were about a foot at the time. They weren't, they weren't in when this picture was taken in 1930 or so. Now those trees are 40 feet tall. So, and again, keep in mind, digging this by hand, that would be no even uh, easy task. And here's the star pool again. The interesting th thing about the star pool is here you can see Emanuel steeple. You see 72. You see Hager's sign right here. And you also see a sign for gas. In this big berm over here, the spring was also there. What West Dundee did is they owned that parcel in the turn of the last century. And they would take via clay tiles, the same as we did for the spring, they would pump it across the river. It would come up by where Massey's used to be down there. And they would pump it there. But unfortunately, clay tile is clay tile. And it was under the river. So after a time, it started wearing. And the river water got in bacteria got in, they couldn't use it anymore. They had to drill their own wells. But you can faintly see the star in the middle of the pool that was made out of stone. And it was spring-fed as well. And they went in there and they would sit 
But then it was used as a gazing pond and they put fish in it. And eventually what happened is because of the constant running water, this crumbled. And uh, uh, right now where it is, is there's a round house made out of stone that was taken from the property. We always just call it the spring house. And for the better part of all oh, 65 years, we have used it, maybe even 70 years, just as storage, a small little storage building. Matt? Now, if anybody were to see bottling like this this day, they'd probably call the health inspector. But this is how, this is how it was done in 1928. All you had was a light, a, ra a bunch of racks, the glass bottles in the crates, a little hose, fill them up, and what they would put in, no seal, no you know, electronic seal of any sort, just a cork. And, and the guy stacking on the wall again, who do you think that is? One of the guys who was with us from the start, Louis Coco. Here you see a manual, and this was the children playing at the D'Angelo sand piles. My guess is my grandfather had these guys doing stuff, and the kids had to have something to do, so they brought sand and pitched uh, the umbrellas in for a picture. I'm thinking they're relatives, could be children of the workers. Were they local? Maybe some of them. But you've got to understand the dynamic of this town at the time. It was German. And you had this Italian coming in, immigrant, who bought all this land. People were not happy with him. So even though he was just an Italian. You would know it if the field by my, where I grew up, no, it's not. It's a different part. This had, has big, tall cottonwood trees on. You can barely walk through it now. It's so thick with wood. When I was a kid, though, junior high age, you could actually play baseball in this area. So you would have my aunt's house would be here. Here's a manual. And you would have, like where you grew up, down here. So that's where, uh, that's where it was. But it's no longer graded like that. So you're driving down Route 72 in 1940 or before, this is all the property. It's called the Old Garden, right across from Manor Restaurant. And you can see the gazebo on the hill, and you can see the name and tropiary that Louis trimmed on the, on the hill. The gazebo on the hill was purchased when my grandfather launched his, his product, D'Angelo Natural Spring Water. It was launched at the World's Fair. What year was the World's Fair? 30? I can't remember. 32? Right. Yeah, when it was in Chicago. So that's where he gave away samples of the water. And he bought the gazebo that stands on the hill from the Japanese. It was part of their exhibit at the time. The, the frame of the gazebo is still there. Yeah, Scott, you've been on the property. I know. <laughs> There's just tons of trees, you can't get to it. But this right here, this little house, I'm sure they use it as a shed, but it was also known as my uncle's clubhouse. <laughs> yeah, now you can't even get back there because if you've ever eaten at the Manor restaurant, it's all woods, it's all grown up. Okay, Matt. This is a view from my office one day, I just took that picture. And the, the other picture is uh, of the fountain itself. Uh, the, the little fountain that's no longer connected. Go ahead. All right, here's a close-up of the bottles that were, were bottling that day. And this was from, uh, I got an email from a guy in Central Florida. He was an antique dealer, and someone had sold him this down in Central Florida. So somehow it made its way there. But the interesting thing about it, you can see the patina and the wood. Uh, it's, it's got our name. It's from that era of the 30s. You can see the glass, how it was then, and you can see there was a, a crown top, no screw top, but the crown top was different yet in that the cork is still intact. These are just some of our products now, how it looks now. Yeah, you can move on, man. That's fine. And Jeff, our driver. My employees are dedicated as well as the customers are loyal. I've got employees, most of my employees have been with me for 25 years plus, and the youngest one has been 15 years plus, so move on. That's the trucks now, so 
I think that's pretty much a wrap. But the one thing I'll say in our sign, which you've seen for many years, is in conclusion, yeah, but in conclusion, yeah, they, they do the gallons. Now you've heard the story of one local Dundee family. This is our sign off our entrance in the history of our business, which is 86 years old. In closing, I would like you to, you to patronize small business in general, not just ours, every small business, is, because more and more in this day of corporate takeovers and that sort of thing, the small family business is becoming a really rare breed. Thank you.